Hallo en welkom bij aflevering 171 van de Enhandling Show. When you're not Dutch, um, in just a few minutes there will be the English conversation with Joel. So hang on. Dit is de podcast waar je leert van ondernemers en ondernemende mensen die bijzondere resultaten bereiken, hoe ze hier gekomen zijn, wat ze doen, de strategie en hoe ze klanten krijgen. Mijn naam is Anne Hanning en ik deel mijn opgedane kennis, ervaringen en expertise met jou. Ik coach ondernemers en bedrijven bij het formuleren van een originele strategie en de implementatie daarvan. Vandaag het gesprek met Joel Kletke. Joel is a conversion-focused copywriter and strategist who worked and delivered results for clients like HubSpot, WP Engine, SafeLight and Ion Interactive. He runs his company like a business, not a creative divahood, as he says. He loves deadlines, strategy, documents and clear communication. Joel is a digital marketer with five plus years of experience on the agency side. He helps you to figure out what content you actually need to reach, nurture and convert your audience. I've been following Joel for quite some time now and I really love his writing. The punch that he gets into this text to... And if you read his text, you understand why it converts because it really triggers you to take action. I wish he would also write in Dutch so he can convert the pages on my website to get more conversion. Anyway, in this conversion with Joel, we are not talking about his copywriting skills or techniques. We are talking about business. This conversation was sparked by an article of how sad the freelancers live because of the low income they have. Joel knows lots of freelancers and solopreneurs that earn more than 100k or even 200k or more. And he shares how he earned in his first year almost six figures just out of the gate. The revenue in the years after that just kept increasing. We dive into the things that any freelancer or solopreneur can do to earn more money. Use the actions that Joel used to improve your business even when your business is more people than just you. Enjoy the insight with Joel. Let's get started. Wil jij weten wat de 11 winstoptimisatie elementen zijn voor online marketing en verkoop? Vraag dan het gratis boekje aan. Dit doe je op winstoptimisatieboekje.nl De digitale versie krijg je helemaal gratis en voor het fysieke boekje betaal je alleen de verzendkosten. Vraag jouw boekje nu aan op winstoptimisatieboekje.nl Je leest het in één avond uit. Winstoptimisatieboekje.nl Welkom in de Erno Hanning Show. De podcast waarin je alles leert over de online sales funnel. Met succesvolle ondernemers en experts, praktische tips en tools die je helpen voor meer resultaat online. Dan nu jouw online sales funnel expert Erno Hanning. Today I'm having a chat with Joel and and we came in contact about this conversation because um, you sent out a tweet Joel welcome to the podcast by the way yeah thanks for having me you sent out a tweet about a um a research or an article about how little freelancers were um earning or how much they were suffering on suffering on um on how much they were earning And you mentioned that you know plenty of freelancers um, that earn a great paycheck. Yeah, no, it, it was this article on NPR that my friend Emma had shared, and it really painted this grim and sad and pathetic picture of freelancing. And when I saw it, I, it really hit a chord with me because, as you mentioned, you know, I know lots of freelancers who are doing more money than they ever made in-house at, you know, fully employed, quote-unquote, positions. And so I felt like the author just really missed the real story, really missed, you know, a side of freelancing and, and entrepreneurship and chose to focus on the negative, and that bothered me. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure how this is in Canada or in the U.S., because you've also connected with um, some other so, uh, freelancers or entrepreneurs. Um, that also uh, have a great business, and I'm going to talk to them in other episodes as well. Um, but I, when I look at the Netherlands, there's a lot of freelancers or solopreneurs that are living um, <laughs> really at a low level with their income. So they, they don't make a lot of money from their business. So they sometimes live in 
under the um, welfare um, level. So, so there is, of course, um, a side of um, entrepreneurships when when you don't do well, it really doesn't do well for you as a person and earning money. Um, so, so I think the story is, of course, um, a vision of a part of the freelance world. Um, but you bring another vision. Yeah, and you know, I agree. There, I I interact with lots and lots of people who don't do well, and as you mentioned, you know, even in in Canada and the U.S., they really struggle. And you know, a lot of my interaction, like I'm part of a group called the Copywriter Club, and there's some people in there who do very well. There's loads of people who do very very poorly. But I think the bigger thing is the realization that. Hey, it doesn't have to be that way. The whole trope, the whole you know cliche of the starving artist or the starving copywriter, uh, the starving freelancer. That doesn't have to be the way that it goes. And it's not some you know woo woo magical thinking nonsense that changes that. It's just picking up the business skills and changing the way you approach it and changing the way you have conversations. And I think you'll find as you talk to more and more of these people who are doing well you start to see patterns in the way that they go about this. And those are patterns other freelancers can pick up, learn, apply to their own business. So if they are in that tier who are really having problems, they can get out of that. Uh, for those people who are doing well, they can continue to learn from others who have found you know, ways forward. There's no one single way to, to succeed at this. And you'll probably get something different from each person you talk to. But it doesn't have to be the case that you're just struggling all the time. No, and I... I, 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 every time when you say something, I have really new questions and ideas. <laughs> um, I have two things that you just mentioned because you talk about the copywriter club. Do you have any idea what the um, how it is divided? How, how how many people, how many freelancers do well compared to people who don't do well? Uh, you know, n no reliable statistics. I think part of the tricky thing in that space in particular is every time they do income surveys and they, you know, a whole bunch of different people have tried to do income surveys for copywriting freelancers. The problem is that they hardly ever differentiate between full-time freelancers and part-time. And so you get this really mixed bag of data where it says some people are making, you know, under 10,000 a year and you're thinking, well, there's no way you can even survive on that. But I mean, part of the reason for that is a whole bunch of the people that they've now surveyed are people who are overseas where $10,000 is a different standard of living or they're hobby writers who just do something in the evening. So I don't have, you know, a great split. I don't have a really reliable metric. I would say that, you know, there it's not 50-50, uh, but I would say that, you know, there there is a pretty large contingent that does pay themselves and survive and sustain themselves at a higher than you know poverty level, uh, I'd say you know that's a that's a pretty sizable group. And then of those who are kind of doing, let's say, really phenomenal, let's let's define that as a hundred thousand plus a year, just as an arbitrary benchmark. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you know there is a, a a fairly large contingent, and at least in the circles that I run in, if I was just estimating, I would say at least ten percent are kind of, you know, at least one in 10 has found a way forward with that. So it is a smaller fraction, but below that, there's loads of people who are still making a good living, you know, a, a sustainable living. And then I would say that people who, you know, I meet who are really struggling to the point that they're flaming out, um, you know, while that is a large group, while that might be considered, I guess, the single largest majority, um, it's not the, you know, the only group. But I wish I had really solid data for you no, there. I think, I think the impression is what I was looking for. And and you mentioned before also I think a part which is really important and then I want to go uh, back into how you came entrepreneur and, and how you made sure that you um, came to the six figures is mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you hang around and you learn from people that are there where you are so that you surround yourself with people that earn you know are on the good side and I think that also when you look at these freelancers that are um, at, at, at the bottom side, they hang out with the same people and they don't grow. Totally. I, I think that's part of the thing. And, and I recently was chatting to some folks about this. What happens often is instead of applying themselves or instead of trying something new or trying something different, they 
pool together in these groups and just commiserate. And so they get so used to sympathy and so used to people saying, oh, I, I feel bad for you and oh, it's so sad that happened to you that they get complacent and they, they never change anything. They just kind of accept for themselves and you know that that this is their reality and and then they you know they thrive off of this sympathy from other people and just to to your note on hanging out with people that are are doing well i mean that's something that i think for me uh you know i didn't originally do that on purpose but over time found myself gravitating not just other freelancers, not just other copywriters, but other people who were out on their own and had found a way to make things work who weren't in my space. Because if even if I'm, you know, hanging out with a say a graphic designer or somebody who runs, you know, a home based business and has done really well, or someone who runs an e commerce shop, whatever it may be, I, I do try to seek out these people who have found a way forward who aren't necessarily just like me because if you only go, even when you're, you're doing well, even if, if you only talk to people, hang out with people who are just like you or in the same space as you or offering the same products and services, there's a lot to learn, but there's a ton you miss. Mm. And so whether it's in your own space, your own niche, your own offering or outside of that, getting to know people who have found a way forward, who have come through adversity, who have you know forged their path, there's tons to learn from those people too. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> um there is every once in a while there's a, a, a clicking going on is there are you taking with something on in the neighbor to your microphone or something oh you know what i'll sit really still this headset kind of drives me oh, the crazy headset, the, the headset okay okay yeah but i'll i'll sit very no, still and it's a, use it's the okay, hands less it, <laughs> i know that when i listen to a podcast and something like that's going on it 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 just it, it just gets you away from the from from the message, and I don't, I don't want to get that um, people that they don't listen to you because they they just hear this clicking. Okay, um, Justin uh, didn't I just that was for the editor. <laughs> um, so so you've started um you you've been to the University of Gal Calgary, am I pronouncing it right? Yeah, you are. Yep, yeah, that's correct. And um. And you did a, um, uh, oh, God, I down. hold on, a Bachelor of Commerce. Right. Yeah. Business degree. Yep. Yes. And, and, it, and if, if I'm understood correctly, you did an, um, a specialization on entrepreneurship. Yeah. I, I chose entrepreneurship because I didn't really seem to fit anywhere else. So I knew more about what I didn't want to do. Um, than what I did. I, you know, for example, I knew like finance was not going to be for me and I knew I never wanted to be an accountant. But at that time, I didn't really know, you know where I fit. I, I knew I wanted to wear a lot of hats. I knew I wanted to, you know, be able to contribute, but I didn't know exactly how I was going to be able to do that just yet. And, and do, do you, for example, have a project um, during the study somewhere that where you start your own business? Uh, there were a few classes that were eye-opening. I think you know, one of the most eye-opening ones is there's you – know, the, the U of, University of Calgary's entrepreneurship program has gone through weird cycles. Like it used to be the prominent one – of, one of the biggest places to do it. And then – That is Joel, teach Joel through a cycle, and so you have to just repeat it. Sorry. Sure, sure. Um, and I'll just I've I've just adjusted my headset too, so hopefully it clicks less. Um, you know, but do let me know if it's if it's doing that again. Okay, so uh, so I'll just start from the top of you know I mm -hmm. I went into entrepreneurship because I knew more about what I didn't want to do than what I did. I knew I didn't want to be in finance. I knew I didn't want to be in accounting. I knew HR wasn't really for me, um, but I wasn't totally sure. And so I think what I was saying is the, the, the program at the UFC has gone through cycles. And so it, at one point, it was like the preeminent place to do it. It was really, really popular. Uh, then when I was there, it was like the black sheep. Um, and, and so hardly any attention, hardly any funding. The university did really, you know, it was almost like they, they pretended it wasn't there. But the great thing about that is you had these professors who could really do what they wanted. And, and there was no, you know, there was no like heavy handed oversight from the faculty. And one of the guys that I learned from was this guy named Ed McMullen. And we did a whole course on putting together a business plan and 
the big takeaway, though, that kind of shocked everybody was his whole research found that having a business plan made no difference, <laughs> made no difference to the success rate or failure rate of businesses launched. And so we were kind of simultaneously like putting this together and going through the process of, you know, what it would look like to pitch for funding or to, you know, to, to come up with a business plan. And then at the end of it, it was, yeah, that's all, you know, it's not a bad practice, but it's not going to guarantee success. And I think that was eye opening for me because the whole idea of just having a plan. So I was like, well, a plan is good, but execution is everything. And that was one of the big things I, I took out of that. So even though I got some of that hands on stuff, and, and even though I definitely would say that as I started building my business, I was grateful to have done a business degree and to have a chance to put that theory into practice. Once you're actually out in the world, it's kind of, you know, no holds barred. All, all of a sudden, all that theory, you, you have to turn into reality and apply and interpret as you do. So I was grateful for that time. I, I definitely picked up skills from that time. Um, but the hard lesson of a plan's not good enough was probably the biggest thing for me. Hmm. And then, so you, you are into entrepreneurship, you study that, and, so, and you, you, are not, you know what you don't want to do, but you're not sure what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And you you still start at a company in a job. Yeah, so I, I knew about the type of place you know I wanted to be. I, I knew that I wanted to be somewhere I could have an impact that I could you know try different things. And I liked the idea because I'd worked for a big oil company as kind of just this junior you know accounting go for fetching files and and that sort of thing to help pay for university. Um, I knew I didn't want to be in a big business. I didn't want to just do, you know, punch a clock and do mundane things. Uh, but it was far from kind of the rah, rah, like start your own thing straight out the gate. So I wound up working at an agency and just fell into a job that I didn't even know existed before I was doing it in doing SEO. Um, and so I got a chance to learn that and apply myself there and try different elements of digital marketing, get a sense for that. And when I applied to that company, I told them that I love to write But at the time, even in telling them that, you know, I was saying, well, maybe they'll have me write a blog post here or there. Uh, but I, I still didn't see the business case for it. I was still kind of oblivious to the whole world of copywriting, as it were. Um, so, you know, eventually at the agency, I, I got to pick up a few website writing jobs. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I, over time, as I worked there, I saw the whole industry, the whole digital marketing world turning their attention towards content and copy and the importance of that. And that's when it finally clicked in my brain, like, hey, what I love to do, what I feel like I'm naturally good at, that's valuable, that's needed, that's that's something that not everybody can do. And once that switch kind of flicked in my head, that's when I started kind of quietly laying the groundwork to eventually go out on my own. Hmm. And then, so you started really learning about SEO and you move towards copywriting but the seo part i i guess because i do it still every day i guess you still use it in your in, in your, your day-to-day -day work in a minor way yeah i mean for me seo is a consideration like what i do for clients now is different than what i started out doing when i went on my own too like when i first started um and maybe this is you know one of the first actionable takeaways for people listening but when you're just getting going I, I was doing blog work and ebooks, and what I liked about that and why I gravitated to that at the beginning was A, because it was what I knew and where my community was. So having worked for an agency, uh, I had spent time, deliberate time, while working for someone else cultivating my network and talking on Twitter and going to events and shaking hands and you know making friends. And I wasn't out there just trying to sell things. And I think that's a, a big difference is a lot of freelancers, the only contact they have with the outside world is just constant cold pitching. And so it's a lot of rejection because they've never given themselves the time or the space or the ability to just be a person and just connect with people on a human level and take an interest in their business without having to instantly be trying to sell um, so I started out doing, you know, the blog and the eBooks and the SEO stuff really did apply then because I was writing for agencies and I was considering, you know, SEO as a factor when I was putting that content together. But the big thing that doing that type of work did for me is 
blog work and ebooks and those sorts of things, they're really repeatable, they're really packageable, they're a really easy sell. So rather than you know constantly looking for a new project every month, I could pitch to clients, hey, why don't we do four blog posts a month at this rate and we'll just recur monthly. Every month you'll have you know four posts for two grand. And and my mentality was, well, if I can sell, you know, four packages of four posts a month at two thousand dollars, that's you know, eight thousand dollars a month, and that puts me pretty close to that hundred thousand dollars a year category. And mm. so finding, you know, for me it was, well, let's start out by finding something in my wheelhouse that's repeatable where I'm not going to have to constantly chase clients. And that's how I got my start that, you know, drawing on my network, drawing on what I knew and looking for those repeatable opportunities that I wasn't constantly having to chase. Yeah. Smart. And, and, and I've, I, I think that what I've came back to um, lately is just what you just mentioned is that, you know, just, just talk to people, um, not just pitch them, but just talk to them as humans and you know, be interested in them and talk to, them, you know, just ask questions and learn uh, what they're busy with and how they're doing and what is their issues that they're working on without thinking about um, something you could just sell them. Just, just, just listen. And, I, totally. I, and it brings so much more um, relationship and value that in the end when they love uh, talk to, talking to you that they will happily to refer somebody to you when they know what you're doing right i mean you know we've probably heard before the whole idea of to get the clients you want they have to know you first so they have to know you exist they have to like you you know they have to like you as a person and want to do business with you and then they have to trust you and a lot of freelancers, I think, they don't pay any attention to that. And so it's just this constant, like when they're pitching or when they're trying to get work, you know, the pitch comes across very much like, hi, I'm a stranger you've never talked to, hoping you have a need. Uh, can I help you right now? And if that's your pitch, if that's the approach, then yeah, it's no wonder so many people do poorly because they're not building relationships. They're not cultivating a network. They're nobody's go-to guy or gal for anything. They're just this kind of stranger coming at it from the outside. And so one of the smartest things I think freelancers can do is look for ways to, you know, as you just mentioned, listen more than you speak, especially in person when you have conversations to ask questions and ask and listen. And, you know, if something comes up where it's a problem you solve, now you've got a natural conversation to say, oh, hey, you know what, actually, yeah, that's an area that I know a little bit about. And, I, and, and now that you've shown an interest in them, they're more likely to listen back. But the other thing is look for a way to position yourself as an authority. So all of the freelancers, 100% of the freelancers I know uh, that do very, very well at some point in their career, they're not all as active on it now because it's a bit like a snowball. You push it for a while and then eventually it gains momentum and rolls under its own steam. But all of them were teaching at some point, whether that was writing how-to blog posts, whether that was sharing their insights on LinkedIn, whether that was speaking, whether they ran a group as an administrator where they were helping connect and solve problems for people. But most of, if not all of, the most successful freelancers I know position themselves as authorities by teaching and showing they could solve a specific problem for a specific group of people so that when people thought of them, they could finish the sentence, oh, Joel, he's the go-to guy for blank who need blank right so instead of that just being businesses who need copy people got to know me as oh he's the go-to guy for software companies who need conversion copywriting and the more specific i could make that sentence the easier it was for me to start closing deals so building authority teaching sharing even if you feel like you don't know you know like you're not an expert yet just teach the things you do know and as you learn new things teach those too but people will trust you more when they see that hey this person is talking about how to solve the problems I have in a way that I relate to. Yeah, really good points is that you, um, the teaching, and, and it can be, as you mentioned, in, in all kinds of forms. You could be uh, a manager on a forum, you could you could show it on LinkedIn, you could do videos. There's all kinds of ways to do it, live training sessions, whatever you do, but position yourself as um, a, somebody who knows something about a specific topic. And then also you mentioned is that really important is that you um, have like a, a focus, a really laser sharp focus on what you do specifically for whom so that it is easy for people to refer you because they know that you work, like you said, for software companies and you do the, the copywriting for the conversion for them. 
Right. And, you know, someone who knows a lot about this whole niching thing is a guy named Josh Garfalo. And, you know, he talks a lot about this and the whole idea that the more specific you are, the more specifically you define who you serve and what you do for them, exactly like you say, that the easier it is for people to say, oh, you know, he, he's the go-to guy for this or she's the go-to gal for that. So, for example, you know, people wouldn't think if, if I floated it out there in casual conversations that, hey, do you think you can make $100,000 a year writing quizzes for companies? Most people go, no, no, there's no way. They never. But Shanti Zach, she does because that's her whole focus. She is so Laser focus, not just on writing the quiz, but helping companies implement it and sending it out. And no one else had planted a flag saying, hey, this is what I specialize in. No one else was tracking the impact. So Shanti could come in and say, I'm the go-to woman for helping clients generate qualified leads with quizzes. And so she was able to do those types of numbers because she owns that space. She owns 100% of the conversation. She is the predominant expert there. So whether it's Josh and I, you know, targeting software and being very deliberate there, whether it's Shanti and Quizzes, Val Geisler and email series, all of these people found a niche, found an offering, found an area of, you know, the zone of excellence or their zone of whatever, you know, expertise and stayed there and said, I'm going to own this space because when you're deep and not wide, so you're really deep in an area, you're a deep expert in an area, you know it inside and out and you're the go-to person. That's better than when you're wide and you know just a tiny little bit about everything and you take whatever comes your way and, okay, uh, sure, I guess I can do a, a press release. So I, I guess I can do a, you know, a video script and, and you're just taking whatever comes your way. The best freelancers that I know take control and say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be an expert But it, it, that is so easy for you to say. I'm, I'm just being uh, I'm cynic here, for, <laughs> to be clear. Because what I, what I listen to and when, I, when I talk to entrepreneurs about this topic, about choosing um, what you want to do, for whom you want to do it, and, and I always try to – what I call um, – and it's, from, it's a phrase that I've, I've used from um, Vern Harnish is hyper-specialization. So you you focus on one client, focus on one of the, the 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 largest problem that this client has, and you have one solution for that problem. So that so it's crystal clear. Like you mentioned, um, uh, the quizzes and you um, copywriting for um, uh, software businesses. It is crystal clear what you do for whom. But it's very difficult for for most of the freelancers, most of the entrepreneurs, to do this, to make this decision, to choose. Because they say, I, I will be missing so much. I will if I if I choose that, just this. I I cannot do that, and I love that too. Or I if it, I choose this, I'm not certain if that's going to give bring me enough money. And if, if I choose this, uh, they have all these reasons why they can't choose. So how mm -hmm. did you choose? I think, and that's a really valid point. And I think you know it's fair to say what what a lot of people get paralyzed on is the idea of. Well, if I'm exclusive to that, then I, I can't do anything else. And I think it's, you know, for me, it was a gradual process. So in the very beginning, I was, you know, as I mentioned, I was doing blog work, I was doing ebooks. And, you know, if someone came across said, hey, I need a case study or whatever, I would try it out. And through doing that in the early days, that's how I figured out, okay, here's something I really like and really enjoy. But once you've found an area, once you, when you think back to your most successful projects, to your, the projects you most enjoyed working on, where's the intersection of what you most enjoyed working on with what you feel you could charge the fairest rate for? And for me, it was as simple as that. I looked at, I really enjoyed working on this you know, website and these landing pages. I really enjoyed working for these software companies. Yes, there is, you know, there naturally is going to be the fear. Well, if I only go there, then I, I miss out on these other things. But it's a bit of a false fear because when you're not known for anything, when you're just another, you know, writer, just another designer, you have a harder time because you're competing against the millions of other people who are doing this exact same thing. They're, they're just another designer. They do a little bit of everything, a little bit all the time. But by putting yourself in a category, by doing this hyper specialization, you're not only eliminating opportunities, yes, you're eliminating you know, some ways to make money, but you're eliminating a ton of your competition. You go from competing with this huge pool of people to now this smaller pool of people. Yeah, but, 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 but. But the pool of potential clients is also huge when you do, uh, between uh, brackets, everything. So, so if I can just do 1% of everything, I still have a great 
um, uh, alive and I earn a lot of money. That's that's fine. That's so. So I think if I just if I focus on one thing, I can never do that. So if I just be as white as possible, I can attract as many clients as possible and have a great living. I mean, it's possible, but you're also extremely replaceable. Uh, you there's there's nothing. You know, like, why would somebody choose you over somebody else? Or, you know, you're, you're going to wind up competing on price, really, because there, there's no other differentiator. So that's how people wind up on, for example, like the Upwork cycle of hell, where they're just constantly taking whatever comes their way because there's no flag for them to plant. There's no you know way for them to say, well, you know, I'm different. Here's why. It's not enough just to be really good at what you do. You can make a living that way. Like I said, there's there's no, like just one path to success. Um, but I think when you look at, you know, yes, there's tons of jobs, tons of opportunity that the pool is huge, but again, you're going to be just constantly chasing, you know, and having to adapt. The other thing too, that we're not really talking about is when you do a little bit of everything, you need to have a process for a little bit of everything. Whereas for me, you need to also learn, you know, a little bit of everything. So every time when a new client comes by, a new project comes by, you need to learn again some stuff that you didn't know before. So so once you're diving deep like you do, it becomes a lot easier. You don't have to learn every time something new. You can use the knowledge that you had um, from the previous two, three projects and use it in this new project. So it becomes actually, that's, that's my point, point always, it, it becomes a lot easier. Yeah, it becomes a lot more efficient because now you're, drawing on what you've done in the past to inform the future and and when a problem comes you know you've probably solved it in some capacity before so it's less you know totally discovering something brand new all the time starting from square one over and over now you can have a process around it you can have a an area of expertise to draw on you can be known as and seen as the expert but for yourself also save a ton of time in doing all that initial legwork hmm. so when you started, and uh, which I also liked about what you just mentioned uh, earlier, was that you started packaging up like writing four blog posts a month um, for a company and just uh, doing that on a retain, not on a retain, just doing that recurring. Mm -hmm. um, so so that you you don't have to change um, new clients every month. You just you know sell them the same package every month so that they stick with you. Mm -hmm. It makes it that makes a lot of sense, and and that is. Probably, um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Probably the the biggest reason why you made almost one hundred thousand um, um, Canadian dollars in, in the first year. Yeah, in in the first year, I think it was really just my you know when I the first thing is that I didn't launch into like cold space, so I didn't I didn't just pull the ripcord. And not everyone has this novelty, right? Some people are forced into freelancing because they lose their jobs. They they weren't able to plan. But for me, the first thing, like I had cultivated a network over time. I had you know, made friends. I had, I had been, you know, trying to build a network and it was continued to be delivered in that. And then the next thing was, yeah, I found this, you know, these repeatable sources of income, these repeatable offerings. And even, you know, to this day, like I now at this point, I'm fortunate to be in a position where I can do more one off work and I can do more, you know, sm fewer, but, but larger projects. But even now I still look at it through the lens of, you know, I, I'll take an auditing package. I have different packages for, you know, conversion audits and reviews, and I sell those to agencies or I sell those to consultants. And, you know, I look for these rec recurring revenue sources to complement and also to underpin these bigger, you know, fewer but bigger projects I'm doing so that I'm never in a position where if one thing dies or if one stream dries up, I'm screwed. I have nothing. There, there's always some iron in the fire. There's always something happening to make sure that, you know, if one well dries up, another one is, is still paying me. Mm -hmm. And did you, when you still were in your job working for the employer, um, did you start your freelancing work on the side or did you start your freelancing work, quit your job and then start freelancing? I started on the side and with the permission of my boss. So that was something that uh, it was important to me to, to feel like 
I was doing it above board and I wasn't trying to pull a fast one. And, you know, that's the opinions on that will differ. And I'm not saying you have to be like me, you know, different situations call for different things. But I started, yeah, picking up, you know, the agency. I talked to my boss said, listen, you know, we we write rep- websites for people every so often, but we're not really selling these things as a package. I'm not really competing with you and it's not going to, you know, invade on company time. And he was okay with that. You know, he knew the alternative was, you know, at the time he probably thought, well, the alternative is either I, he lets me do some of this on the side or runs the risk of me just out the gate, leaving and going. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, while I had the safety net of a, a full-time job, I was, you know, in the evenings, on the weekends, I was starting to cultivate and get practice and build a, a little bit of a portfolio so that when I went out on my own, I wasn't starting with nothing. I wasn't coming empty handed and frantically scrambling. And, you know, I, again, I say that from a point of privilege because I had the, the novelty, the ability to do that. I had security to begin with. Other people are thrust into, you know, the situation. They have to find a different way forward. But one of the pieces of advice I give people considering going out is, you know, don't don't quit your day job. Like, hang on to it. And, mm-hmm. you know, for a time, ride that safety. Use that income to, to fuel what you want to do next. And when the how long did you write the safety? Uh, you know, some some of it was intentional, some of it wasn't. So I had a goal in mind. I wanted to make sure that before I left, I had three months worth of income saved in the bank. Hmm. So I, I wanted to have it be the case that worst case scenario, if I didn't pick up a job for three months, you know, I, I'd still be able to survive. I, I needed to have that safety net. I also held on for longer than I thought because, you know, I'm not superhuman. I was afraid. I thought, am I going to be able to make it? But the more I looked at it and the more that I planned for it and the more that I executed and actually doing the work and test myself, I didn't, you know, remember we talked about having a plan is not enough. So the more time I put into actually doing the work, building the assets, making it less likely that I would, you know, announce my, my freelancy to the crickets and, and no action. Um, you know, that gave me comfort. So I held on longer because for a long time I wanted to make the full-time thing work. And then realizing, no, the company is moving in a different direction than I am. And, you know, fair enough to them. Um, but once I had my, my three months saved, then it was okay. The, now's the time and the opportunity mm-hmm. is here. How much, how much was three months for you? Uh, so at, at the time, it was, it was three months of my, my then salary. So not my current. Um, no, but at, yeah, at the time... I believe I was making about sixty-eight thousand Canadian a year. Um, so you know my math is terrible <laughs> in the morning, but uh, you know the the equivalent of um, not what you know three three months of salary sort of saved. Yeah, probably in, in twenty thousand, something like that. Uh, yeah, less than that. I, I think I only needed a runway, you know, sixty-eight, like seventy thousand divided by. 12, whatever, like I, I needed to have, you know, somewhere between 12 and 15,000 kind of, mm. uh, saved up just as, as a cushion, um, you know, for, for worst case scenario. And that was generous too, because I wasn't living off of, you know, five grand a month. I wasn't consuming all of that in expenses at the time. Like I, I lived in, you know, my, my rent was relatively low. I was pretty frugal on groceries. I did a fair amount of clipping expenses to make sure I'd be in a, a spot that I could, you know, make that stretch as long as I could. But yeah, I, I looked to have a cushion before I left. Right. Great. And then the second year you make over 100,000, you make about 130,000. Um, and that's, that was, that's already, uh, three years ago. Yeah. So, how are you doing now? Uh, my business continues to evolve and my priorities have continued to evolve. So for the first few years, my whole focus was on how much can I make? And, you know, I was trying to prove a point to myself and I think I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. You know, I wanted to replace this. I, right when I quit my job, I got another offer that would have paid me 110000 to go do SEO somewhere else. And that became my benchmark. I said, okay, I, I need to prove to myself that by investing in me, I could beat that. And, and I did it. I did it in my second year. And then, you know, I started to burn out a little bit because my focus had been so much on that that I was like, you know, am I, am I happy? Am I using the freedom and flexibility of freelancing? So, um, you know, in the, in the subsequent years, my goals changed. So, for example, two years ago, I, I wasn't as concerned about income as I was. I lived in New Zealand with my wife for eight months, and that was my, my big goal. Um, today, you know, it's, it's a bit of a balance of both. Like, I just had a son in July, and, you know, so it's a balance of 
you know, what, what, how much time do I want to have versus how much do I make? So in the, in a less roundabout way, what I'm trying to express there is, you know, priority shift. And it, for me, it's no longer just about how much I clear. Uh, but for the past, you know, I, I've beat the, the six figure mark consistently, uh, for all of the years since doing it for the first time in the past two years, it usually after, you know, not just revenue. Cause a lot of people quote revenue and say, I'm doing 200,000 or 250,000, mm-hmm. you know, profit, gross profit net to myself, um, probably in the vicinity of, you know, 150 to, to 175. Um, that's just great. And then if you look back in, in to that year where you had a job and, and you did the freelance on the side, how many hours did you work in a week? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I was scheduled to work 40 and I think I, I put in, you know, the 40 to do it. Uh, I think if, if most of us, if we're honest, when we have full-time jobs, are those 40 like hyper-productive hours? Maybe not. Uh, in the last year, though, I think the thing that, that I, I only realized after I left the agency, I was scheduled to do 40, but I was doing way more. I just cared way too much. And I was you know, the lead SEO there, all these projects I took so personally. So you know, in an average week, I'd be at the office for 40, but then on my own time, I was still you know, 50 or, or 60. And I was a part of that was, you know, it was part of why I was just drying up and losing my, my motivation at the agency. But about mm-hmm. 40, 40 was what I was slated to work in house. Um, and sometimes I wanted yeah, to be more but and then sometimes add, add the amount that you worked for, as a freelancer. Yeah. I mean, before I left, I was, I would do kind of the 40 in the office and then my weekends I treated like work days for a while. So you can add another 16 per week. Um, you know, I, I would put in eight hour days, whether that was, actually doing a project or writing for myself or, you know, creating projects for myself to upset myself up for success. So yeah, 56, 60. Yeah. So, so, and then in the last couple of years, um, you've been writing your blogs, you've been creating your website, um, you've had all these great, because you are a, um, uh, I like the way that you write your copy. I've, I've been following you for quite some time now on, on Twitter and I've been going through your stuff once in a while and 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 i see what you write and i love the way that you write and the thing is that um you've been because of your writing you've been also been publishing in other um outlets and other sites you've been speaking at really uh, large conventions um you even did a ted talk but so so you really got out there yeah i i think you know, that ties back a little bit to that all started picking up steam once I specialized and once I really figured out, okay, this is what I want to be known for. This is the work I want to do, who I want to do it for and what I want to be known for. And when I focused in on that, then things started to happen. So I started to get more kind of case studies, more success metrics I could point to. I got an opportunity to work for HubSpot and they track their metrics in a, a big, you know, uh, you know, a, a big success there. And then I was able to translate that you know, that project and that success and the opportunities to speak about it and publish about it. Um, I think one of the things, you know, if, if there's a lesson in there for someone saying they're saying, well, I don't have those types of opportunities today, beyond just specialization, I think one of one of the big takeaways is do some audience leeching. So identify whether it's people in your space, companies in your space, events in your space, they're all working hard to cultivate their own audiences. And a lot of companies, whether it's publications or whatever, they need content. They, they need experts. They need people to come into the space and contribute and lead and teach. And if you can do that, then you can make their audience your audience. You have these opportunities to do things like webinars or speaking or publishing or, you know, don't just rely on your own ability to generate your own audience, but look for people who have audiences that you'd like to get in front of and then find natural, human, mutually beneficial ways to to do that. Now, for me, a lot of that just sort of happened. And then I started realizing the benefit of it and was more deliberate about it after the fact. Um, so, so let's, let's, because you've been starting to using all these great case studies, like you mentioned before, like HubSpot and let's make a short sidestep there because you've also started another business, um, of creating these great testimonial stories. Yeah. Case study buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Customer success stories. Yeah. So, I mean, that came about when, uh, you know, I, I had been happily doing the software work and, and continued to do that, but I had an opportunity to work with uh, 
there, it, let's just call him a guy you don't say no to. He was in a position of power, and if he needed something, I would do it. If if it was a video script, whatever. Like I wasn't doing that for everybody, but if this guy asked, you know, he was just so influential that I thought, I'll just do it. You know, I, I'll break my my specialization for him. So he asked if I would do a case study for someone he was connected to, and I thought, I thought, yeah, that that sounds like something I could, you know, I could I could do, and it's not you know overly you know complicated. I I could figure that out, and so. I did it and I, I put together this case study and then I sat back and I thought, you know what? Here's an asset that companies struggle with. It was clear they struggled with it because I looked around and I saw, okay, the companies that I see, even in my space, they do these not at all. They do it quite poorly. So here's an asset that companies will pay for that they don't know how to do or they struggle with that I could build a process around. And I had tried early on in my freelance days to kind of transition to like an agency model and subcontracting, and it went horribly. And that's a whole probably different podcast of lessons I learned <laughs> screwing that up. Uh, it went terrible. And so I was really leery. But here I thought I could focus. I could focus on this one asset. I could build this really great process around this one thing. And, and I looked at it and nobody had planted their flag. No one said, we do this better than everyone else. I thought, I'm going to do it. So I, I slowly, very deliberately, it wasn't an overnight success. It wasn't I went from you know zero to 60, but I kind of started laying the groundwork for case study buddy. And one at a time, I brought people into the fold that I thought could help me do this thing better. I didn't go seek out 10 people and say, here we go. We're, you know, some people have a lot of success doing that. For me, I always fall on my face when I do that. So I, one at a time, kind of built this side gig. And now it's getting to the point that this thing has taken on a life of its own and is quickly demanding you know, more and more focus and, and is showing more and more opportunity. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's great. I think the way that you did this, because you've, you've, you've not added it to your current website, your current business. You've just created something special for that. You created a separate website. You have a separate name, a separate branding. Everything is just separated from your current business so that still when you go to your copywriting um, website, uh, uh, you will find nothing about that. Well, nothing's not really true, but you, it, it, it's, not, it's not a product that you sell there. It is no. separated from from that business, which it, it, I think it's really a great idea because it makes it really clear what you get here um, is you get you, but you also get the text, you get the conversion. That's really really clear, and I see that going wrong with many businesses with entrepreneurs that they they, you know, they like you mentioned you have somebody that has a great project for you, you can't say no to, and then you like it, then you do another one, and then it get added to the website, and then after a while you have like six or eight or ten products on your website, and nobody knows what you're doing anymore. Yeah, it kind of you start out niched and then you wind up you know out of it again. You wind up out of specializing all over again, and now you have to reevaluate. Oh, here's all this other stuff, and. You know, that was a deliberate choice for me. I wanted to maintain, you know, my own brand. My own work is all going to be software conversions. I'm not going to mess with that. And I saw an opportunity, too, where I looked at, well, this can be a productized service. I want this to be bigger than me. I don't want to be the only face, you know, there. I want it to be a team. I don't want people to have to know who I am to trust this company. And so I spun it off, you know, as you, as you kind of talked about, to have a clear line between, okay, I'm still involved in this. This is still, you know, I still have a role to play here, but these are not the same company. These are not the, the exact same person just doing 19 different things this has the power and strength to to stand on its own two legs yeah i think i think that's just really smart and i i like the way that you did this and you that you made this deliberate choice um at the specific time that you just didn't you said yes to the project and you saw the opportunity and then you decided to make it a separate thing so um so you have a team there people are doing the actual work with you or for you and let's just touch a little bit on the um, thing that you mentioned before, because I read about that, of, of course, is that you try to set up a team before on the copywriting site and you had like 10 subcontractors at one point. Yeah. Why, why is that not your model? Uh, it's not my model today because I went about it the wrong way. And so the short version is, 
Uh, my eyes got bigger than my stomach. I, I thought to myself, how hard can this be? You know, surely everyone has the same standards of excellence as I do. Surely everyone, you know, can hit a deadline. And, and so I really, I tried to move too fast. I, I took on too many people at once. I took on, you know, 10 subcontractors I saw. And I thought, well, the more hands, the better. You know, the more writers, the more money I can make, the more scale I'll have. And, yeah, you know, I'm sure anyone experiences just laughing to themselves even hearing that because everything is harder than you think it'll be. And writers are difficult and processes are so important. I had no process for it. I had no plan for it. I had no execution. I'd never done it before. So I went from zero to 10. I didn't go zero to one. I tried to do it with 10 people all at once. So you can build an agency. You can build a team. But what I learned through that process is, you know, or through through the journey of trying to do that first, I said, I don't have a good process for this. I don't, I don't love the management side of this right now. And I think as I've, you know, as my career has progressed, I've gotten to love the management side more, which is why I eventually did it with Case Study Buddy. But in the beginning, I thought, I don't love the management. I hate editing. I hate having to edit these people's work. I hate chasing people for deadlines. And so, you know, it was just a comedy of errors where I thought it was going to be easy. I thought it was going to be super scalable. And it took me out of doing what I wanted to do, which was writing, and into what I didn't want to do, which was managing and chasing and, you know, trying to corral people. Um, when I did it again, when I tried again with case study buddy, that's why I did it one at a time. And I did the work myself first and I built the process first and then I brought people into that process. And now I had a measurable thing that I could weigh them against. I could see how well they stuck to the process. I could see how they made the process better. They thought of things I hadn't thought of, but I was slow and deliberate. I wasn't trying to be this lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's why it worked better the second time. Can you see um, that you will hire one or two subcontractors um, on business casual copywriting? Yeah, I, there is actually. And, and, you know, business casual's website is a bit of a case of the cobbler's shoes. I've been so busy writing for other people. I, I need to update mine. I have one subcontractor that I work with ongoing at business casual, and I've really worked closely with him now for a few years. He knows my process. He knows my standards. We communicate very well uh, in the past month, actually. So, you know, you mentioned like I've now been out doing this for five years. So anyone thinking that you have to just explode out the gate, that's not my story. But uh, just last month, I've taken on a second and I'm oh, taking the cool. exact same approach. Yeah. Cool. Slow and steady. Cool. Cool. Smart. So the, the, um, the business is still growing and you're building a team and so you will expand, you will grow the business. So there will be more managerial roles, but um, it will be also, in, you will, it will probably be ending up a business that you can actually sell in the end. So it's not a freelancing business anymore. It's it's becoming a real company. Yeah. And that was, you know, my, my deliberate goal with case study buddy is I wanted it to be something that one day I could sell that was bigger than me. I've had a harder time, you know, giving up the reins, I think, with business casual because it's a little more specialized. It's a little tougher. Um, you know, the business is changing and evolving. And, and to be honest with you, I'm I'm at a moment now where I'm evaluating, you know, uh, re-evaluating. What do I want this to be? Am I happy, you know, just keeping this as a consultancy, keeping it very small? Do I want it to be an agency that I can sell one day? And, and I'm still sorting that out. I, I know that I don't want it to be a huge team and a ton of legwork. I, I don't I don't think I'm in the business of trying to build these 50 person operations. I don't think that's me. I don't think that's right for me. Hmm. But with with business casual, I see it as something where, you know, if I have a very small team, a team I trust that can execute where I give them great opportunities, I'm able to negotiate pay that maybe they couldn't get on their own. I'm able to bring in clients maybe they couldn't land themselves. You know, maybe I can have a really solid kind of micro agency and maybe selling it isn't the goal. Maybe it's just, I, I let case study buddy be that. And, and I let business casual just be kind of my bread and butter and, and, you know, keep it small and, and, and controlled. I'm still figuring that out. Okay. I'll, I'll be, I'll be following on that. That's great. <laughs> the, um, I cannot finish this talk without um, go, going into your uh, funny and interesting um, TED Talk. I mentioned it before, but there is because you built a special website, and this whole TED Talk was about this special website. <laughs> so, so just just give us a peek in that. Yeah, um, kind of. A, so, I mean, a, a peek is 
uh, when I worked at the agency, I it was I mentioned I didn't even know SEO was a thing until I was in the thick of it. And once I saw that Google could be manipulated, my brain started turning. I thought, how can I, how can I put this to my advantage? And what could I do that could kind of startle people or or make people laugh, but prove a point? And so while I was at the agency, I undertook kind of a, a secret little project on my own. I found success with it. I succeeded. You'll see in the talk. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. And I learned some really interesting and important things about. Google and the impact it has on the way we think and the way that we make decisions in the process. So, um, you know, I, I became something that I always wanted to be, <laughs> and uh, and I uh, learned a lot in the process. So it's it's only five minutes long. It's quick, and I think people will really enjoy it. I, I will. I'll make sure that we um, add the video to the show notes, like the link for sure. That's that's. Did it did it help you to get your wife? No, <laughs> no. I, I mean, it, <laughs> that's, uh, that was a spoiler, alert, but let's let's <laughs> let's keep it at that. <laughs> yeah, no. I, it got me. It got me business. It got me opportunities. <laughs> uh, but but no, I got a lot of uh, identity <laughs> attempted identity theft. Um, <laughs> but but no no. My wife came a different way, and thank God for that. <laughs> So, so I hope you are intrigued now as a listener and you go want to see this um, short TED talk because it's, I think it's eight minutes long or something like that. It's, it's short and it's, it is funny. You have to watch this. So Joel, um, let's wrap this up. I have two more questions. Um, one is what is the book that you um, advise most people at the moment to read? Um, I'll, I'll offer Two, if if you're interested in getting better at copy, whether for to sell as a service or just for your own business, there's a great book called Breakthrough Advertising. Don't buy it on Amazon because people try to sell it for four hundred dollars. That's not that's not real. So breakthroughadvertisingbook.com. It's old school, uh, but it, it covers a lot of just really good process and thinking. And great thinking equates to great writing, and this will teach you how to think better. Uh, the other book that I'm really enjoying, and the, the name of the author escapes me, but uh, the book is called Never Lose a Customer Again. And I'm finding um, really that you know it's so important to mind the people part of your business, whether you're a one person business or a 1000 person business. And that book just does a, a really nice job of kind of breaking down some, some new ideas, some new thinking, the importance of this. So I would recommend that book and I'll make sure I get you uh, the author's name for the no, show. No, I notes. got it because I have it on my Kindle and I've read the book. So it's, it's um, a Joey Coleman. Yes. Yes. Joey Coleman. Yes. That is a great book. So I, I, I agree. That's a great book that you want to read. So we didn't talk at all about, no, not at all, but we didn't, we didn't hardly talk about the thing that you really do well and you are really good at it. That is the copywriting. And like I said, I love your writing and um, people should check it out. So how can people find you? Yeah. So if you want to engage with me personally, you know, have a chat or whatever, the best way is on Twitter at Joel Kletke. And I do respond to DMs, messages, and all that there. You can check out some of my work and, and my teaching on businesscasualcopywriting.com. I publish a little bit on Case Study Buddy as well. Um, but Joel, you know, my Twitter account is, is the best place to chat with me. Or, you know, drop me an email through the Business Casual site and I'll happily, you know, respond to you there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. It was a pleasure talking to you and to learn about how you know, there is a different way of, you know, of, of the business world of, of freelancing uh, or solopreneuring. And you know, if you do it right and you hang out with the right people, you learn a and you become visible, you teach, um, that, that's, it, is, it should not be an issue to earn six figures in whatever um, continent you live. Yeah, I think, you know, in summing it up, the, the short way that I'd sum it up is you have to start changing your mindset from an employee mindset, waiting to be told what to do, waiting to be dictated to, to more of, you know, this, this boss mindset, this manager mindset, where it's, I'm going to decide for myself, I'm going to make the hard decisions to focus, I'm going to lead the conversation. And I think once you do that, once you find your areas of strength and you teach in whatever way comes natural to you, that's where I think you start to see the, the wheels turn and, and you start to see the difference happening. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Dat was het super interessante en gaaf gesprek met Joel. Je vindt de namen en links die we noemden in het artikel dat bij deze uitzending hoort. 
bijvoorbeeld de video die we hebben genoemd. Ga daarvoor naar nhorning.nl slash show 171. nhorning.nl slash show 171. Heb je vragen, opmerkingen, reacties over deze aflevering met Joe of in de podcast in het algemeen? Stuur mij een e-mail op podcast.nhorning.nl en ik hoor super graag van jou. Uh, wil je automatisch dit soort gesprekken, afleveringen vanzelf op je telefoon ontvangen, zodat je ze elke keer kunt luisteren? Zoek dan op jouw Focus Podcast app, bijvoorbeeld de Apple Podcast app die standaard op je iPhone zit, naar de N Show. Klik op het plusje om te abonneren en tada, je krijgt vanzelf de volgende aflevering op je telefoon. Dankjewel alvast en graag tot de volgende. Dankjewel voor het luisteren naar de Erno Hanning Show op ernohanning.nl.